Thank you. So welcome back, everyone. Um, for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, my name is Tammy Kim, and I'm your Region 2 Chair. I'll be graduating from Torocom, New York this year and starting my psychiatry residency at Zucker School of Medicine, Northwell. I'd also like to introduce Treya Vassin and Damian Pizarro, our local psych SIG leaders at University of Rochester School of Medicine and CUNY School of Medicine, respectively. Uh, they'll be closely involved in monitoring today's event, so please message any of us for help. I'm going to start off by um, giving an overview of the application workshop. Um, that'll be the first part of this um, residency workshop uh, wing of the conference. Um, and this will include um, an overview of ERAS, um, NRMP, and things you may want to prepare beforehand. And after that, we'll segue into the residency Q&A panel. Okay, so just gonna share my screen. Okay, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Okay, cool. Alrighty, so this is the first part of the residency workshop, part one, the application overview. And I am your region two chair. Um, if you have any questions at any point, you can pop them into the chat. Um, I would prefer to take all questions at the end just so we can get through the um, application overview. And um, you can also wait till the Q&A panel to ask those questions as well if we run out of time. Okay, so a brief overview of the application process. Um, you're gonna wanna research the programs that you're interested in for requirements and deadlines. Um, you're going to also want to download the most current ERAS uh, user guide. Um, you can Google that um, on ERAS um, and it'll pop right up. Um, I think it'll currently be updating still as we're just finishing the 2020 to 2021 um, cycle. So you might wanna wait a little bit. Uh, register once only using your school issued token number um, on ERAS and create your profile titled the personal information tab. And people will tell you this repetitively throughout the cycle. It's really important though, it's the only section on your application that can be um, edited um, even after you submit your entire application and you'll find out why. Um, and then you'd also want to confirm your letter um, of recommendation writers um, and download the letter request to the email um, to email um, your letter writers. And you'll also want to take a professional portrait photo. Um, you'll see an example of that later. And you have to write your personal statement, authorized release of your USMLE and or COMLEX. Um, so depending on whether you're an MD or a DO, um, if you're a DO who's taken both, uh, you'll want to authorize release of both. And upon final review, you can submit your application. So just a disclaimer, uh, be sure to refer to ERAS for the most up-to-date information. And don't be afraid to call their offices up, um, like actually on the phone. I know a lot of us don't do that anymore, uh, but they usually are very friendly, informative, and professional, and usually very succinct. So this is your dashboard. This is the first thing that you'll see on ERAS. Um, and so you'll see that some of the information is redacted. That's my tiny photo there that you can see in my official name. You'll see the AMC ID pop up as well as your email that you've designated to ERAS. Um, over here on the uh, widget that shows the application information on the far left, um, it shows the date and time that you've submitted your application, as well as the last time that you've updated your personal information. And the rest will follow. All right. So this is the personal information section that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is the only section that you can update throughout the process. And the reason why this section is so important is that um, obviously it includes your name. Um, it includes the email that is linked to your message center on ERAS. So this is the email that will um, kind of receive all your notifications for interview invites. And um, you wanna make sure that the email address and the telephone numbers uh, stay updated. And a lot of people move throughout like um, their medical school career for like rotations as well. And so you'll want to update the um, portions of the address as well. Okay, so yeah, so this is your address section. And um, don't feel stressed to like take notes because uh, the recording will be available later and I'll uh, email out this PowerPoint to you all. 
Okay, so a little bit about uh, work authorization. Um, I know everyone here is not like necessarily a US citizen or a resident. So there are a bunch of kind of designations that ERES has included, including DACA, whether you need like a visa. And so all these options, the scroll down menu that you see here is the same as the one down here with all the check boxes. So for instance, if you need a visa sponsorship through the ECFMG um, or the teaching hospital and H1B um, to complete the entirety of your GME like training, you would um, click that designation. Um, and the other question that's blocked out here is please identify which of the following will serve as your basis for work authorization for the entirety of your GME training without any need for visa sponsorship. And you can select all that apply. So for instance, if you're a DACA recipient, you might also have like an EAD, an employment authorization document. So you wanna check both of those. And this is just the work authorization included. If you scroll further down ERES, um, you'll see like them ask, are you currently authorized to work in the US? Um, and so um, if you're not, you can click no. And I'm sorry, I see something in the chat. Let me pause for a second. So I would refer to this link, right? So the question is, can we apply to programs that don't sponsor J1 or H1 visa if we have an H4 EAD from spouse? So Unfortunately, I'm not the best expert on this. I think also every hospital is different. That's what I've noticed throughout the interview trail. So I would um, direct your attention to this hyperlink at the very bottom. It's copied directly from ERS, um, ecfmg.org, evsp, applicantsrequirements.html. And um, there will be quite a lot of information on this online. Um, but again, um, it does tend to differ program to program. And that may be a question that you might want to save for the Q&A. Q&A panel later with uh, Dr. Safin, who is a program director. Okay. So a little bit about the NRMP match info. Um, so right here, you see this redacted um, NRMP ID number slot. Um, first, you want to select um, yes for the NRMP match if you're all applying to psychiatry. Um, it differs like for urology, ophthalmology, um, and those uh, specific specialties um, that uh, kind of do their own match. But uh, for the rest of us, it'll be NRMP. So you want to click yes and um, you'll go onto the NRMP's website and um, register for your own um, account. And you have to pay a one-time fee of $85 and you really don't wanna sleep on this. Uh, registration opens from, opens from September um, all the way until end of January. Um, you can like register after January. I don't recommend it because you will pay a late registration fee. And of course, if you forget, that would be devastating if you've done all your interviews and you can't even rank your programs. So definitely don't sleep on this. A lot of people just go ahead and register for this the same time they're filling out ERES. And then once you've registered for the NRMP, you want to come back onto this page um, in ERES and enter your ID. Oh, and of course I skipped. If you're participating in the couples match, you uh, click yes. And um, there are extra fees for the couples match. It depends on how many programs you and your uh, partner are ranking. So the prices differ for that a little bit. Um, I believe for the NRMP, it's a one-time fee for like the first 50 to 100 programs. So I can't imagine anybody is ranking um, any more programs than that, but uh, you do have that option. You just need to pay a bit more. So this is the additional information section. Um, as you can see, it shows your USMLE ID, NBOME ID, um, whether you're an AOA member, if you're a DO student, um, you should be. If you forget your number, which I think 95% of people that are spoken do have, you just want to call them up and um, just ask them for your AOA member uh, number. Um, and of course, you should be familiar with your USMLE ID and NBOME ID number already. That's, all, that's already um, on your um, board, like licensing examination services website if you just log in. So uh, the reason there are asterisks there is that um, you want to provide them just so you can, um, your scores can show up. So you'll go to a different section and um, tell ERAS basically that you're giving them permission to release your board examination scores. And they can't actually release the scores unless you um, input your ID numbers. And then there's um, other things here like ACLS uh, certification. You want to input your expiration date. Same thing for BLS. And these are some honor societies down here that if you belong to, you can select. 
And if you don't, if, if something doesn't apply to you on ERAS, you don't have to like type in NA, um, you just leave it blank. Like just leave it as is with the select button showing and it'll like, it, it won't even show up on your application. Um, just a word on how to search programs on ERAS. Obviously the most, the easiest way to research a program is to Google the program and go on the website because usually most programs will have like a wealth of information about their program, about their curriculum um, available online, but you can search them in ERAS as well. Um, the amount of information you'll find on here is limited. It's usually um, just who the program director is, um, a telephone number, the uh, PC or the program coordinator. Um, but you will want to search at some point because you want to save the, these programs to your ERS account um, and then check out with them once you certify and submit your application. So you'll pay for um, the number of programs that you apply to. Um, other important steps. So um, other than selecting your desired residency programs, you'll also want to assign documents such as your personal statement, your letter of recommendations um, to the programs. You'll purchase programs, as I mentioned before, when you check out, um, you'll be uh, given like a fee for um, every program. I want to say it's it's a little hazy for me right now. It's been a while, guys. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so it's like a it's like a lump sum for like the first few programs, and then you like add like per program. Um, so the next step is um, when you assign. So this is actually really important. When you assign documents um, at any time after you've submitted your application the first time, um, or the only time rather during the cycle. Um, you'll want to update the residency programs every time you um, kind of upload a new document. So for instance, if you have a letter of recommendation that comes in after you've um, submitted your application, you really want to notify um, your programs uh, because they may not be aware of it. I've heard that some programs will um, go in on December 21st, for instance, was the first date this year that uh, programs were allowed to, were given access, so to speak, to see the applications on ERAS. Some programs will print out like all their applications the first day and go through them, and then they'll go back at another date and then print them. It's, I think every program does it differently. So um, basically you just wanna update the programs every time you change your application in any way. And of course you wanna register for the match or NRMP. Okay. Um, some tips are that you don't have to complete everything in one sitting, but be sure to save every section before exiting. Let's see, we have something in the chat. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, so somebody's uploaded the ERS uh, program fees. There you go. So up to 10, it's $100. And then for the next uh, couple, you pay like a certain fee each and it gets pricier the more you apply to. Thank you. Okay, so... Right, so you don't have to complete everything in one sitting. Uh, just be sure to save every section before editing, uh, exiting, sorry. And uh, certifying your application locks it, meaning the only portion you can alter afterwards is the personal information section. Okay, there's another question in the chat. Okay. Okay, so supporting documents for ERAS. For the student to upload to ERAS, um, these documents include your personal statement um, and your photo. Your dean's office is responsible for uploading your MSPE or your medical student evaluation, um, as well as your medical school transcript. And um, letter of rec writers must upload their letters to the ERAS um, LOR portal. Um, and you'll have to usually waive consent to like see the letters. Um, and board examinations are released um, by the NBME or NBOME themselves. Okay. Okay. So here's um, here's some details on the personal statements that you're going to probably start writing uh, very soon. Um, there's differing opinions, but generally they should be one to two pages in length. Um, I just want to caution against writing something that's too long because uh, program directors. Um, need to go through a lot of applications. So um, sometimes if it's too long, um, they may not be able to devote all that time to um, really um, reading that letter very, uh, that statement really thoroughly. I've also noticed on the interview trail that um, it's pretty obvious that some people are reading the uh, statement as we're speaking. Um, so, and which is understandable. They're all like super busy attendings and, uh, and such. So I just wanna 
you know, ideally it's short and sweet. It's, um, it's poignant. It's um, kind of, it, it has an impact, but it's not too long. I think that's like the safest way to go. So mine was like a page, a page and a sentence over or something like that. Um, you may also want to include information related to your professional background, um, your academic clinical qualifi qualifications, what drew you to medicine um, or this particular specialty. So if it's psychiatry or child and adolescent psychiatry, addiction medicine, you want to be um, specific because you do want to stand out and really kind of show off your passions and um, as well as your career goals. So information about your personality, aptitude, style um, that make you a good fit for this specialty. Um, I cannot stress this one enough because um, among all the questions that I would get from interviewers um, during the application trail, it always came back to this, like what makes me a good fit for the program? What makes me a good fit for the specialty? What about me um, was kind of differentiating me from the applicant pool? Um, and of course, this is a chance to showcase what makes you stand apart from the crowd, um, such as unique talents or uh, professional passions, um, how they desire, once again, into your desired specialty. And you want to draft this in a Word document before copying and pasting it into ERAS. Um, it'll be just really annoying if you try to, if you attempt to type this directly into ERAS. Um, so yeah, just do it in a Word doc or WordPad beforehand. And definitely have your essay reviewed and create critiqued by people you trust, such as an advisor, um, a professor, or a mentor. Okay. So little more in personal statements. This is what the section looks like on ERAS. Um, so right here, I've shown you what I've titled the personal statements. Your residency programs never see the actual title of a personal statement. So this is purely for you. So I applied to um, like general psych. So general psych would have been the letters that I assigned to programs that are four years in length categorical psych. Um, the child and adolescent programs might have been um, if a program had a specific track um, a certain kind of reputation that was very strong in child and adolescent, uh, perhaps they offered a fellowship, that sort of thing. Um, I catered a slightly different letter for those programs, or sorry, I keep saying letter, a personal statement for those programs. And it shows the updated status. As you can see, I was pouring over it till the very last day, I'm just agonizing over it. So yeah, so you can go ahead and create a new um, personal statement by um, clicking create new, this blue button here, and pasting your statement into the uh, word box that shows up. Okay. So letter of recommendations. Um, for psychiatry, uh, most programs require at least two letters. However, um, many programs require a minimum of three. One moment, I think there's a question in the chat. Oh, do we need to make a specific personal statement stating why we chose our program for a few? Okay, so um, so the uh, she asked, um, I'm sorry, um, this person asked if we need to state why we chose our program um, for like your like top programs or if it should be, I'm guessing, like a general letter for that specialty. So different people different uh, do it differently. Um, I think if you feel really strongly about a specific program, it's definitely not a bad idea to include that in your personal statement. I think generally speaking, personal statements are more kind of catered to why you want to apply to the specialty and what you hope um, is the outcome in pursuing a career in the specialty. Um, however, there is um, no reason why you can't tailor it to a program. Um, you'll just be slightly busier because you'll be writing slightly different um, personal statements for each program that you uh, feel really strongly about. Um, but again, that may be a really good investment. Um, so yeah, so you don't have to. The answer is you don't have to, but you can. And usually um, for this year anyway, with the pandemic, they um, kind of gate, they actually sent out a lot of supplemental applications. Um, I don't know how it'll be this coming year. That may be something that um, programs will start to accommodate even as we transition to like a pandemic, like a post pandemic existence. Um, but so it kind of felt like very like med school slash college when um, programs are sending out all these supplemental applications. And so you would take that time to usually answer like why we're interested in this particular program, uh, what we hope to get out of this particular program. So I think there will be opportunities for that elsewhere. But again, it's not a bad idea to include that in your personal statement if you want to. 
So I hope that answered your question. Um, going back to the letter of recommendations, um, usually, Usually um, you need two at least, but some programs do require a minimum of three. And if you don't fulfill that minimum, let's just say you've been, that doesn't necessarily um, discount you from like, um, or disqualify you from getting an interview with this program. Um, if you happen to be like waiting on a third letter of recommendation, let's just say, and it's like already like November. However, after you interview that program may reach out to you and they probably will for that missing letter. So um, letters from department chairmen, um, section heads, and well-known attending physicians tend to carry more weight. However, a well-written, strong letter for someone from someone who actually knows you and has worked with you closely is arguably the most meaningful, especially in a field like psychiatry. Um, so yeah, so anything that um, kind of includes like a narrative writing style, like your personal statement and letter of recommendation is really important in a field like psychiatry, because I think I mean, I'm biased, but I think that people like on mission on admissions board for uh, psychiatry programs really do want to get to know you as an individual, um, which may not be the case for all specialties. So definitely use this to your advantage and get letters from people who actually know you. Um, and remember quality over quantity. Um, don't just try to like collect as many letters as you can. Try to, you know, obtain high quality letters. Okay, so LORs continue. There are some differing opinions about when to ask for a letter. Um, some argue that you should ask at the beginning of the rotation, um, that it is your intention to earn a letter um, during this rotation. And what that does is it gives the attending the benefit of a heads up. So, you know, they might be a little more observant of your performance, while other people will argue that you should ask at the end of the uh, rotation because you've established a rapport and a relationship with the attending. And they're just more likely to say yes, especially if they like you. So um, occasionally attendings will even offer letters at the end of a clerkship um, if your performance has been exceptional. And once letter writer, uh, once your letter writer agrees, you wanna provide them with the uh, ERAS letter request form and your CV just to like help them kind of beef up your letter and like sing your praises. Um, and that writer will upload the letter um, to your uh, letter of recommendation portal. Um, and just remember you wanna remind them from time to time time to time, like, you know, ask them if they need any assistance. Um, you want to be cordial, not pushy, but they are pretty busy. So oftentimes your writer will need some reminding. And the assigning bit is pretty self-exclamatory once you like are on ERAS. I know a lot of this might not make 100% sense yet, but you will have the PowerPoint next to you when it's, um, when um, I want to say when June rolls around and you guys actually start filling out ERAS. So, um, Let's see. Oh, and, and the nice thing about letter of recommendation assignments is that you can tailor them to specific programs. So if you get a letter from a child adolescent psychiatrist and you're applying to a program that has a child adolescent um, fellowship attached to it and you kind of are aiming to fast track into that fellowship, then it would be like incredibly to your benefit to assign that particular letter. Um, to this program. Whereas if you're um, an individual who's applying to multiple specialties, like, I don't know, if you're applying to like uh, psychiatry and family medicine, and you're getting a letter from um, a family medicine attending, then you obviously, you may, well, not obviously, you may not want to assign that letter to psychiatry. You may or may not. So use your best judgment, but there is that flexibility provided on ERAS. Okay. And this is just what the page looks like. So if you go to the action section, you go to select, you can assign it, you can download the letter request, and you can also choose to email it directly from ERAS. And this is how you add a letter of recommendation, shows their name, their title, their department, the specialty to which this letter will be assigned. And um, it's, uh, there's a note right here saying that your programs won't see the specialty that the letter is assigned to. So, I mean, that's, that's definitely nice because um, if you have like a bunch of letters um, available on ERS and um, let's just say you're applying to a bunch of different specialties, that's probably to your benefit that programs can't see that section. Okay. All right, so for the MSPE, this is your medical student performance evaluation. Um, this is just a comprehensive assessment of your performance from year one through three of medical school. So fourth year is not included. No electives you do at the beginning of fourth year are included in this. It includes your class standing from preclinical years and clerkships, and it also includes information about your notable characteristics. So that includes hobbies, uh, research, any extracurricular information that won't be found elsewhere on the MSPE. 
And this year they were released early in October, right before um, programs had access to ERES. Um, but you wanna be vigilant of those ERES deadlines for the upcoming cycle and be sure to follow through with your school's um, requirements and deadlines for supporting, uh, for any like supporting information that you have to submit to your school um, to help them write your MSP. And the medical school transcript is pretty straightforward. It's sent um, directly from your Dean's office and they're automatically sent to every program you apply to. There's something in the chat. Yeah, so definitely you should. Um, the question was, should you check off my right to waive the letter of recommendation? You should. Um, it's pretty typical that you will never see the letter of recommendation that was written for you unless your letter writer, like you ask them and they agree to show it to you. Um, I don't recommend that um, just because that's not like tradition. It's it's pretty much like you're not supposed to see it. And like, yeah, so this is another reason why you should ask people that you know are going to write you truly um, excellent letters. Um, right, so for the photo, these are just the uh, requirements for your photo, the dimensions. You wanna be very mindful of this. This is all available on ERAS as well. So check with them. I don't know if they'll change like the dimensions or resolutions that are necessary this year, but you just wanna be mindful of that because if you upload something in the wrong like file size or resolution, your photo will turn out very demented. So just be mindful of that. You wanna look good on your ERAS. Okay, more on score reports. So, um, right, so be sure to enter your uh, board uh, licensing ID numbers. Um, once you go to the documents tab, you'll go to additional documents tab and select yes to authorize. This will all be pretty self-explanatory once you're actually on ERS um, and you assign the score reports to your uh, desired programs. So you'll notice now that every piece of documentation on ERS can be assigned to your uh, programs. And if you're retaking an exam, be sure to request a retransmission of your score reports um, and touch base with your programs to update them regarding your new score. And um, one important thing to note is that when you um, kind of give the sign off to uh, send your scores to the programs, you can't like pick and choose like um, which scores that you're showing to them. So let's just say you submit um, your permission um, at a certain point and you've already retaken your exam, your first attempt will also show up. Okay, message center. This is your baby during the application cycle, meaning check on it as frequently as possible. This is primarily how programs will contact you to set up interviews. Um, they usually get forwarded to your designated email that you've listed on eRest but um, you want to come back to the message center directly on eRest and check that um, as much as possible. Um, a tip is that some people, so I thought this was pretty funny. So some people um, I've spoken to create a new email address specifically for ERES and they designate a unique alert tone for the emails. Um, I think this is useful if you're like doing, if you're like very busy on clerkships and you just want to be very mindful and you have like a specific alert set up for invites as they can fill up really, really quickly. I've seen some interview invites fill up in minutes, I've seen some of them fill up in a matter of hours. Um, very rarely do they take like more than a week to fill up. So you definitely wanna be on your A game for this. Um, this is some biographical information, pretty self-exclamatory. Language fluency, it's pretty self-explanatory as well. You just add an entry. So any foreign languages that you speak, any like second or third languages that you speak, definitely now is the time to toot your horn. Um, and be sure to include uh, English, especially for psych. They want to know that you'll be able to like converse with your patients properly um, and proficiently. So definitely include that. Um, so higher education, you're going to want to list everything from undergraduate all the way to medical school. So like a, a master's, like an MBA, things like that, a, a PhD. Okay, additional mem uh, information. So this part is another time to toot your horn and tell them how many like memberships you have and like honorary societies and how many awards you've won. So this is, you wanna spend time on this section even though it looks very unassuming. So um, some examples of professional societies can be the AMA or um, psych sign if you're a member. Um, you can also list touch awards for medical school awards, um, other awards and accomplishments. Um, you can include the ones from undergraduate as 
you know, everybody here is super smart. You've all made it to medical school and you've worked so hard. So all the awards that you've earned during undergraduate, you can definitely put that in this last box, um, like the Dean's List, Honor Societies, Research Awards, Athletic Awards, Community Service Awards, and so forth. And this is the training and experience section. Um, it includes all previous training. So this is only if you have already completed training um, at another program or another specialty or in another country, you wanna include that here. Um, publications, this kind of refers to any publication you've done, be it peer reviewed or non peer reviewed, even articles. And then the last step is certify and submit. So um, you'll see uh, personal information, biographic, education, and experience, all these sections here. Um, and of course, for you, it won't be incomplete when you um, submit that. Uh, yeah, and just one last uh, screen. Well, I think this is a, one of the last few screenshots is for interview uh, invitations. So you'll see the program name down here, the specialty, the city, state, accreditation ID, and the action. Um, so it'll show like, um, like when you're like um, lined up for the interview, essentially. Um, and this is just another view. You can look at it in calendar view as well. Just a word on sub eyes or uh, audition rotations. Um, so I think we're almost we're approaching three four twenty. So okay. So yeah. So we'll move into the Q and A panel shortly. Um, just a quick word on audition and sub eye rotations. Um, um, some feel that auditions hold little weight in the realm of psychiatry. Um, applications and I want to tell you that's wrong but um, many wonderful things can happen during an audition rotation. First of all the most obvious pro is that you have like a whole month at least of FaceTime with um, the faculty. Um, a, a, a little con however is that if your performance is unsatisfactory or fails to impress faculty or residents it may negatively impact your candidacy. I personally feel that that shouldn't hold you back from trying um, for shooting your shot with the program of your dreams. Um, because I mean, a month versus like a four hour interview, especially if it's virtual, I think that month goes such a long way. Uh, therefore, it really is um, in your interest to um, complete an audition with a program if you're really interested in it. Uh, there's a quick message in the chat. So I believe you can do rotations after you've graduated from med school. Um, I believe a lot of the international medical graduates do this. I've definitely encountered um, um, people who like were graduates of like Ross um, and St. George um, after they've graduated from like doing audition rotations. Um, yeah, so the answer is yes, yeah. And generally, the sooner you look, the better as spots fill up really quickly. Um, and you can start um, submitting applications anywhere from March to June. Um, and you can start looking as early as February. And you really don't want to put this on the back burner. I know most of the M3s right now are studying for step two um, or level two, but uh, you really don't want to put this on the back burner. Try to do this um, in any free time that you have. Uh, make it a priority. Um, and these are some pros and cons of uh, kind of the different uh, methods of looking. So you can look on uh, VSLOW or VSAS. Um, the only con is that this can get pretty costly. I think it's 15 to $30 for a program. And usually there's very limited spots and it's pretty competitive. Um, you can also look through your medical school's uh, network. So looking at affiliate sites and the obvious pro is that you'll have a high success rate and um, you may be given priority as a student at your medical school. Um, the con is obviously that it's limited to the availability of your affiliate sites. And uh, don't be afraid to cold call. Um, I've actually had really good results with reaching out to programs, emailing them. Um, a lot of uh, residency programs will have like, uh, like a GME website and some of them will even have applications for applying to their um, visiting rotations. And if you have a compelling reason like tying you or like uh, showing con con in terms of conveying your interest to a program, uh, definitely be sure to include that. And just one final word on the NRMP match. Um, this is what the website looks like. You'll Once you've registered, you'll be given a username and or you assign yourself a username and a password. Um, this is just some redacted information here, but it basically shows if you've paid, obviously your fee status will be paid. Um, your verification status depends on your school as they'll have to verify you um, as um, ready to graduate by the time you're ready for residency. Um, and your applicant status will also show up as certified once you've certified your rank order list. 
And this is like the first, like just like the very tippy top of what the rank, rank list looks like. It'll show your institution description using your program name, um, the rank that you've designated in the far left column. And you can drag and drop these to change them at any point before um, the very, um, before rank order lists are due essentially. So this is what it looks like. And every time you drag and drop and you change the sequence in your order of your uh, rank order list, uh, you can certify your list once you're done. And you can do this as many times as you want before um, the deadline. Okay, and you get this message, ROL certified successfully once that's complete. And this is the page that I think um, everybody looks forward to seeing at the end of it all. Um, you find out that you've matched and you'll see this little green box showing you that you've matched. Um, it'll show the program code, the program description. Um, and if you're if you've matched, you won't be soap eligible. So you'll see these le red letters. So don't have a heart attack if you see red letters anywhere. It just means you're not soap eligible. Um, if you do, however, um, have to participate in soap, uh, you'll find out on Monday that you um, unfortunately have not matched, um, but you do have until Thursday to um, enter into the SOAP program and match to a program, um, hopefully. And then everybody's uh, specific match results as in the program names are released on Friday. All right. And that concludes our presentation part one of the re resident application workshop. I see there's a question in the chat. The specialty field for LORs is optional, right? Um, so the question is whether the specialty field for a letter of recommendations is optional. I believe it is. Um, and you definitely don't have to, yeah, you don't have to tell your letter writer that you're using it for an unrelated specialty. Um, I, I recommend full transparency if you're if you're like, you know, getting a recommendation letter from someone. But yeah, like let's just say you're applying to um, you know, different specialties. Like it's you don't have to inform your uh, letter writer per se that you're applying to so and so um, specialty. Um, they will most likely ask where you're applying, and that's up to you to disclose or not. But yeah, I think it's also helpful if they know because they can cater your letter more if that's what you want. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. And there's another chat. I'm gonna stop sharing for now. Okay. In your opinion, what do you think makes an application stand out from others? Okay, so I feel like this is a question that the entire uh, Q&A panel can address. So um, I'm just gonna move on to, let me see clock here for a second. Give me one moment, folks. Okay, yeah, so I think we went slightly over time by five minutes. I apologize. Okay, so um, well, I'm, I'm going to um, just stop sharing my screen. Okay, okay, so uh, we have uh, Dr. Safin joining us as well as a bunch of residents and fellows here today. I'm just going to take one moment. I need to um, adjust something, so I'll be right back. But um, if you have any questions for the Q&A panel, definitely start typing them into the chat and um, I'll be right back, thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Staffan. <laughs> Sorry, I was just finishing up the first part as you guys, That's as okay. everyone walked in. That's okay. I'm just going to pin all the uh, residents who are with us today so that everyone can see their lovely faces. Okay. Hi, Dr. Martin. Okay, Hi. and we have Dr. Rockas. Oh. Hi, let's see, just hunting for everyone. Okay, that's all. Oh, and Dr. Kablova, okay.
Okay, I think that's everybody who's with us so far. So um, I'm just going to start by introducing everyone, um, or actually we can go around and take a moment if our uh, uh, program director and residents and fellows can introduce themselves, that would be great. Uh, starting with Dr. Safin. Hi, yes, everybody, you can hear me okay? Good, okay, so I'm Dr. Daniel Safin. Uh, I am a, a CL psychiatrist and I'm also the program director at Mount Sinai Beth Israel in Manhattan. Um, I am on the executive council of the New York County Psychiatric Society and I'm past president of that as well. I'm excited to be here today. Dr. Martin, you show up next on my screen. Thank you, Dr. Safin. Hi, I'm Dr. Martin. I'm a CAT1 fellow at New York Presbyterian, so that's Columbia and combined. Columbia and Cornell's combined program. Completed my adult training at NYU, and I'm also on the executive council for New York County Psychiatric Society. Dr. Rockas, I see you next. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Hi, I'm Dr. Rockus. I'm a PGY3 at NYU, um, and I'm on the resident committee um, for NYCPS. It's nice seeing all of you. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Rockus. And finally, Dr. Kablova. Hello, my name is Dr. Kablova. I am a PGY2 at Carlin Hospital, uh, and uh, I'm also working with uh, Dr. Rockus. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Dr. Kuklova. I see that a couple of residents aren't here yet. Hopefully um, they'll come in later when they can. Um, so I'm just gonna start by um, personally asking you some questions that we've collected um, during registration. Um, and then we will get to the questions in the chat. Uh, we have time. Okay, so the first question is, are your chances of matching to a desirable program significantly de decreased by an under average step one if the rest of your application is great and step two is average? Also, oh, so. It's a two-part question. Let's do that first. Um, so from my perspective, and I think from a lot of program directors, the board scores are kind of taken holistically. There are some programs that have specific cutoffs and things, as I'm sure you've seen in application sites. But realistically, a lot of us are working to try to do a holistic review of the application that includes both the experiences, the rotations, the elective things that you've done, the volunteer work, and the scores are there to combine um, with grades. So both, you know, a, a lower score on step one versus then a better or average score in step two does show progression and that does help, but it, I don't think those are the only pieces that we look at. And so I think it's kind of that broader picture that we're trying to take into consideration. If any of the residents or um, Dr. Martin wants to jump in. Okay. I think, I'm oh. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I think just from um, my own experience, just in the different programs I've been um, involved with, I know um, a lot of program directors and committees do read the full application. And so um, I've heard kind of the same thing as Dr. Safin is, is kind of saying that he does, you know, it is reviewed kind of holistically and, um, and, and the application is read um, in psychiatry. Um, so every little bit helps in the other areas. Uh, and then just um, for those of you who don't know, like the psychiatry program directors, there's a national association called ADPERT. Um, and that's where all the psychiatry program directors get together annually. It's always at the end of February, beginning of March. And we just had our meeting virtually again this year. And, you know, these kind of holistic reviews are discussed every year of how to best do them and move us forward in that space. And we do really seriously try to take all that into consideration because we think being a psychiatrist is um, something that requires a broad depth of skills across various different components of what you find on an application. So we do try to, I mean, the fall is crazy for us as program directors. I mean, we are spending so many hours, like just seven days a week because all the applications come out and it's such a quick turnaround time. And it's like well, each person's application is 40 something pages. And so we're, it's a lot of reading, but um, we try to really do it because we at least in definitely in my program's experience, we get richer candidates that can kind of come up to the table more um, ready to start. There can be someone who's really great at doing exams, but then might not like, you know, clinical exams like step one or step two, but then might not really be great with patients. So a lot of the other experiences are critical for us in making decisions. 
Thank you, everyone. Um, and I think from my personal experience as an applicant this year, I think um, definitely, um, I think we're fortunate when we apply psych that the faculty and everyone on the admissions board truly wants to get to know you as an individual. It's not just a numbers game. So um, I think we are really truly in one of uh, the greatest fields, but I'm biased. <laughs> Okay, so the second part of that question, um, any tips for matching out of state given that away rotations are limited or interviews are virtual? Um, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, Dr. Safran, go ahead. No, it's okay, you can go, you can go first. I was gonna say, um, I think, so I went to school in the Midwest and my family's from the Northeast. Um, so what I did, and I think, you know, it, it can go either way, but I picked a few programs that I thought aligned with my values and really I was a good fit for that were in the area of my family. And I waited a little while and I did email a few. I wouldn't recommend doing it to like every single program because programs talk, but if your family like is in Idaho and there's like one program in Idaho and you really want to be in your family or you have some tie to the area, I think like a very nice email just stating your interests um, may be helpful. I think it was helpful for me, um, but I wouldn't like blow program directors, like email every single program because they do talk. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's kind of not fair. You, you, you want to be honest and kind of um, ethical through your process. Um, I don't know, Dr. Savin, sorry, <laughs> you may have a different opinion, um, but, but that's kind of, no. it worked out for, for me. No, I, I think you're spot on with that. I think if you have a targeted area that you, like geographic area that you want to go to and a targeted reason for that, I agree with Mary from the perspective of it's not going to serve you well to send that out to every program you apply to because sometimes people do hear about that across the board, but it's definitely helpful like if you're coming from a, a geographic place where you're not in the area that you'd like to wind up to pick the programs you think you match up with and then it doesn't have to be a long email, you know, four or five sentences. If no one wants to, you know, the program directors were getting so much during that time frame, it shouldn't be like four or five paragraphs because that gets to be too much. But if you can kind of make something targeted, four or five sentences, and send to those programs in the area, and then the one piece I would add to this process is the kind of the timing of it is really critical um, of when you send that. And what I mean by that is um, if you want that to be um, influential in potentially the process, you really kind of want to do that, not like right in that close window, either right before the application, like uh, the, for program directors in a typical year, this year it was pushed back, but usually mid-September, we get to like September 15th, we get to start reading the applications in ERAS. Um, so it's really helpful to kind of get that, those emails in the first few weeks, like two or three weeks, three max, but like two weeks before that or the immediate like one or two weeks thereafter. Because as I said, we break up our applications and the whole admissions team is reading. And so oftentimes it's not that far after September 15th, like maybe two or three weeks that we're starting to send out invitations for um, interviews. And so if you do have something in that makes you stand out personally about why you want to come geographically into an area, it's helpful for the program director to know that in that more narrow window when they're going to be starting to make decisions that admission, the applications at least at a lot of programs come out kind of in batches. Um, but if you wait too long and try to write those letters in like October or November, by then a lot of people have already set their couple tiers of cycles that they're gonna do. And then they may pull you up um, for some vacant slots that we all hold. Um, but if you can kind of send it in those two weeks before and those two weeks after the ERAS space, um, it's usually helpful, you might catch them and that will be helpful in them knowing that you have a particular connection to a geographic area. Definitely. I think that all makes a lot of sense. And that was definitely my experience when I was applying. So um, the second question is, um, or the third rather, to the residents, uh, what do you wish you knew about residency when you were a fourth year medical student? Um, I think I didn't, I think my spreadsheet wasn't so sophisticated. I think I just had like call or no call, but not all call is equal. Um, so really thinking more about that. And then I wish I like factored in more like the resident perspective and just like talking to residents about like how 
their experiences um, like at the program that they're at and trying to pick up on like the vibe um, because each program like does have like a different type of feel. I would say there's some that are more like paternalistic um, and will like micromanage versus some that are kind of like um, you learn on the go. So I just wish I thought more about like my learning style and like the style of the program because there are, are like those differences um, that are important to look out for. Yeah, I think um, in looking at programs, I was, I also kind of neglected the importance of looking at that factor of like, paternalism versus not. And so it's interesting that you brought that up. I was actually thinking about that the other day. Um, I also think like really thinking about the patient population in psychiatry, you know, it's not like surgery where you're just going to like go in and it's about numbers. You're like really dealing with people and just thinking if there's certain, um, if you've identified it, if there's certain populations of people or certain pathologies that you're super interested in, um, you know, speaking from experience, like in New York, we see, tons and tons of psychosis and like a lot of um, drug use and things like that and at some programs it may be different so just thinking about like the type of patients you may want to see is another um another thing that I hadn't thought of kind of prior to interviewing and I I I'm happy that I landed where I did but it's something that I would have um, put more uh, weight in um before okay thank you everyone um, and the second part of that question is, um, with residency applications being virtual, how do you recommend applicants to evaluate programs for fit? I think I might want to point out, um, I'm not sure if residency applications will be entirely virtual this year. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. And I don't know that we know yet either as program directors, that's been a hot topic of conversation on our program director listserv. I think a lot of us are going to or have to take the guidance of our GME across the health, our health, individual health systems. And I know for sure I can speak about my own health system at Mount Sinai, they have yet to decide um, on what will be this coming fall, if it will be all virtual, if it'll be a hybrid, if it'll be back to being all in person. I don't know yet, so it does make it a little difficult for all of us on both sides of the fence to plan for this space. I think, um, you know, programs, and I can speak from the program director side, you know, have tried to do a lot to give you some other windows into programs virtually, um, whether that be doing different kinds of tours, having different portions of the interview day or outside of the interview day where you can spend some time with the residents. Um, and I think, um, as Dr. Martin was saying, it really is kind of important to have some conversations with some of the trainees in the program, if there's some place that you're really considering to kind of get a little bit more of a sense in that space um, about that. Uh, I think sometimes it's a little easier to pick up on some of the nuance and energy of a program in person. But I think that said, I think a lot of it did come across way better than we expected as program directors on the feedback we've gotten over the course of this cycle. Um, from the people who are applying due to the fact that a lot of us, you know, built out um, Instagram pages and rounded out our websites and put different videos in and things like that. And I think even then, once you get offered an application, actually an interview slot, um, you sometimes often, at least I know from my program, get some additional videos that are more tailored to the people who then we're going to be interviewing. So then more information comes through. So there's a couple different tools that we hope helps you get a sense of the programs to identify your own fit to them. Yeah, and I would say along with that, in addition to speaking to the residents, I think when you are speaking to residents, um, careful speaking like with chief residents, at the end of the day, the chief is like admin and part of like the interview process. So if there are like little nuances or like concerns that you might have, or maybe the most honest opinion, um, I, I don't know. I've, be a little hesitant with speaking like with the chief as like your go-to person because they are at the end of the day um, linked to admin. Dr. Rockus, did you want to say something? 
I'm good. Thank you. I'm just going to repeat talking to as many people as possible. Um, I'm kind of in the same spot that everyone else is. I'm applying to fellowship and I'm thinking, oh goodness, how do I find a very good match when um, chances are it's going to be virtual and and so I think like for me, I started talking to different fellows in different programs. And I think it's the same for residency. If you can reach out and, and talk to the residents, I think that's probably going to be the most honest feedback you get. For sure. And I, I definitely recommend um, attending all the meet and greets that um, become available um, in the upcoming season. For us, when it was virtual um, applications, like um, there were a ton of meet and greets, um, a ton of second looks that were being offered. And I think any... Um, opportunity, especially if you can't visit the hospitals themselves in person, if you can just attend like virtual hangouts with the residents, I think, you know, they tend to be pretty, very candid um, and really, um, I think you do get a feel for the culture, even if it is virtual. Okay, so um, the next question is, are step one scores reviewed as pass fail, even if you took it and received a score prior to the change? I think this is a question largely for Dr. Safin, but everyone can jump in if you know. Um, at, at this point, everyone's trying to figure that out, right, with that recent change and things. Like, I think that if you do have a score, it will be looked at in some way. Um, I can't say that it won't be, but I think that we are going to have to kind of put some more generality to that. And I think there's a lot of discussion, definitely at the meeting that we just had of the national program directors in, in end of, at the end of February, um, around how to do this, right? Because it's um, not that, again, it was... Uh, the only point, but it was one of the points that we used for some data. And, you know, now obviously that won't be part of the picture. And I think that's why over the last few years, we kind of knew that was coming. And so we've been working on making sure we do more holistic evaluation. So I think if you do already have a score, it will be reviewed, but I don't know that it's gonna, I don't think there'll be different categories for people who have a score and then people who don't. It's just too complex, too many different variables. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense unless like the NBME finds a way to kind of um, censor your your numerical score, so to speak. I don't see that happening, but yeah. yeah. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so the next question is, how can um, international medical graduates get U.S. clinical research, clinical or research experiences and letter of recommendations for residency applications? Um, I could start. I mean, I think it's a challenging prospect and one that definitely takes a lot of groundwork. I think it's doable and I, I think it's about a lot of outreach and a lot of connectivity. And I think that um, people who have been successful in those spaces, it's often about definitely um, engaging your uh, professional network, making sure you're tapping into attendings and stuff and having them contact people for you that they know um, to kind of find an open door of where you can get connected directly with a researcher or a clinical opportunity. As I was hearing the end of your last talk, like rotate, like formal rotations and stuff are often difficult and, and competitive to come by. And as, as this question is about like, right now with some places still not allowing in-person rotations, it's it's complex. Um, but that said, I think there is a lot of opportunity to get involved on different levels with research experiences. And I know a lot of the international medical grads that we interview have worked with some different people at different health systems participating in research. And I think through that experience, they've done some great work. And then also those people have been able to write them letters of recommendation based off of that space. Um, and that's always very helpful for us in doing, you know, as we're taking this holistic view, kind of get their opinion about their work and their engagement with teams and stuff. It might not be and, and don't undervalue that. It's not, it may not be direct clinical, like in terms of, oh, I was on a rotation and we took care of these four patients, but oftentimes you have a lot of interpersonal interactions and those letters can be very specific to your skill set and stuff and very helpful for us in evaluating candidates um, based off of some of those things. So I think it is a lot about, you know, looking through different programs, websites, working through your professional network and then sending emails and following up with some phone calls, right? It's about kind of trying to catch that person. A lot of times emails like this will, you know, kind of linger in someone's inbox for a little bit. So it is about catching the, them at the right time with the email or the phone call, even if it's to their assistant, a lot of times that sometimes helps as well. So, you know, don't be afraid of those spaces. Thank you, Dr. Safin. Oh, Dr. Kapova, did you want to add to that? Yeah, <clears throat> I am uh, an international medical graduate, so it definitely helped me 
uh, to show tie to psychiatry when I was able to find uh, clinical experience. Uh, but there is no direct answer, like where to go, just about networking, um, looking at the doors and uh, looking. Thank you, Dr. Kovova. Okay, the next question is, did you know you wanted to specialize in psychiatry during undergraduate or medical school? And how did you know? Uh, my, well, I can speak for myself. My road was kind of a, a, a very long one. I was a last minute psych applier. I was between internal medicine and psych. Um, and I did my internal medicine sub I and I was most annoyed I didn't get to spend enough time with patients. So I was like, oh, I made my decision in psych, you can spend time with patients. Um, and so I was definitely a last minute decider. So if you two are in that position right now, um, don't worry, you have time. Um, I think, you know, like looking back, a lot of my experiences were about like stories and narrative. I was an anthropology concentrator. Sorry, there's a dog playing behind the camera. Um, I was an anthropology concentrator in college. And so it all made sense in the end, um, but it did take me a while. Um, so I went to med school knowing I like working with um, patients with autism. So I was kind of between child psychiatry and child neurology. Um, when I entered med school, I ended up loving my psych rotations um, and fell in love, especially with like psychosis, schizophrenia, like determining the path, the personality beneath the pathology. And I really just like my attendings. I thought they were great mentors. I was involved in like the APA. Um, and I just felt like it was more my people. Um, and also like once I like schizophrenia and psychosis, like I couldn't do child neurology anymore. Um, so it was a mix of things I'd say. Okay. I'll move on to the next question. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, what will be the impact of lack of clinical elective experience for IMGs who wish to apply for psychiatry in the 2022 match? Um, I think uh, similar to some of my answers earlier in the day, I think we're going to kind of be looking at that broader picture. I mean, it, it it, it does help if you have some clinical experiences that can kind of speak to that space. But I think if, you know, depending on your other research engagements, your volunteer experiences, um, your work in med school, I think some of those spaces can count and we can review some of that stuff. And if you, it, you know, speak to your narrative about why psychiatry is so important or of interest to you and your personal statement and things like that, I think you can kind of tie together a story that, um, works even if there are, you know, maybe not a lot of, or in some situations, it's very difficult to kind of get those clinical spaces. But uh, it's definitely possible. Okay. All right. And the next question is um, How do you find a mentor for research um, and externship experiences? So um, I can actually partially kind of try to answer this question. Um, and in, in my experience, um, looking for research and externship experiences, um, I always like to start in my school network, I think, because your success rate is pretty high. So if you have like um, clinical professors or even preclinical professors, um, a lot of them, um, some of our professors also had PhD backgrounds. Um, even the ones who did not were uh, very keen on doing research um, themselves. So. Um, most of them were very uh, forthcoming and welcoming with um, any of us who wanted to partake in research. Um, so finding a mentor was honestly the easy part. I think doing the research is the hard part because you have so many things going on. You're juggling schoolwork, you're studying for your boards. So um, definitely um, try to balance everything. I think everything is about a balance at the end. Um, and looking for um, externship experiences, I presume you're speaking about um, kind of doing um, clerkships outside your school network. Um, the, I think the most popular resource is probably VSLO, um, although as I mentioned before, it is, um, it can get costly and it can get um, quite competitive. Um, another way to do it is, as I, I kind of covered this in the latter slides of my power, uh, PowerPoint, but um, you can uh, reach out to kind of um, 
within your school network. Um, and then you can also cold call, like as Dr. Seth mentioned, don't be afraid to reach out to GME offices. Um, they do get pretty uh, swamped in the, in the fall because of applications. But um, again, you shouldn't be looking for um, clerkship experiences too late in the year anyway. Ideally, you should be lurking now, um, um, early summer at the very latest. And so you should apply as soon as you can for those experiences. It does tend to be first come, first serve. And the next question is, um, how will program directors evaluate applicants if, oh, I, sorry, I think this one was already covered. It was a duplicate. Okay. Um, so uh, how does the number of years since graduation affect your residency chances? Um, the number of years since you graduated medical school, um, I would say is a factor in what we look at when we're doing the holistic reviews. Um, and what I mean by that is, the big thing that residency programs are looking for is being able to kind of piece together your story of what's happening. So um, if it is that it's been, you know, each year that kind of goes past medical school that you might not have matched um, or we're doing other things, we kind of need to understand what that narrative is and it, we don't want it to be too hard to figure that out in reading your application. So I think the things that you can do that really enhance your chances if your years have been further um, back from when you graduated medical school to when you're applying is to kind of make sure we can clearly understand how you've been spending your time in between, what's been happening, where have been your efforts, in what ways have you stayed connected with the field or explored things that are adjacent to that. If that kind of um, trajectory we can uh, easily piece together for ourselves, then, you know, some programs do have cutoffs at like five years or, you know, it's, there are certain programs that have spaces in terms of time. Um, but that said, there is always exceptions. It depends on what that narrative is in between. If you're doing research, if you're, you know, working in something else related to other, another portion of healthcare or business, like there are a lot of ways that these stories can kind of play themselves out. And so it is about us being able to quickly identify what that path has been in between, um, because then we're curious if it, if it's murky or the application is left murky in terms of us trying to have to like go back through there a couple of times to figure out the time frame, that's harder because in the glut of applications that we get, like my program has 13 slots and we usually each academic year, so we have 52 residents total, but 13 slots per PGY year. And like we usually get 1200 to 1300 applications for those 13 slots. And so if it takes us too long to have to piece together what happened each year and we have to take two people to dig through that, that's going to be a barrier. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think this is kind of a similar question. Um, can you talk about how to best address a gap during med school? I think Dr. Stefan um, kind of covered that. Um, Although this question adds in both ERES and interviews, um, so maybe if you could address how that could be um, kind of uh, talked over smoothly during interviews. And I think kind of continuing on what I was saying from the last portion, it really is about being honest with your experience, right? Whatever that is, um, whether you've had a medical setback, whether you've had a life setback, whether there's been something else that pulled your interest away in terms of research, or you needed to take time to explore your interest before you were confident about your choice in choosing this particular residency. Um, we're not perfect at it, but we are all psychiatrists, most of these interviewers. So like, you know, that kind of honesty can kind of ring true in an interview. And like, if we can hear that experience, hear your genuine trajectory through the conversation, like the ERAS application, the thing to do there is to make sure, like I said, in terms of years and space, that there aren't any gaps, that we can look through the education timeframe, see the years that you were in school. If, if that years, if those years stop and then there's space before you're applying, we can then look into either work experience or research section and see what was happening in that in-between space. Similarly with um, uh, volunteer experiences or things like that. And then, you know, addressing that, um, some in ERAS, there are some boxes under things that can kind of explain gaps or times. And again, I wouldn't suggest putting like four or five paragraphs in there. It really is something concise about like, you know, my interest took me in this direction or I, or this happened and I, you know, it doesn't have to, and it's not about disclosing if it's a medical situation or a health thing, you don't have to disclose all your, like, please don't di disclose all your diagnoses and things like that. That gets to be too much. Um, but just like, you know, I worked through things. I had a lot of support. This is how it happened. I'm back on track, eager to work. Like, and then kind of sharing that 
story in, in live interviews, um, they technically can't ask anything about medical diagnosis and stuff like that. If you offer that up, that's fine. But, you know, but they, they would want to hear again in in-person interviews virtually or uh, virtually as well about that gap. It'll help them understand and that makes them more comfortable um, when they're going to put their rank list together. If they really did like you as a candidate, then they're like also like, you know, someone on that admission committee is going to bring up like there were three years here. Do we, are we solid? We under, are we, do we have a solid understanding of what happened there? And then if the people who did your interviewing can say, listen, we talked about this during my thing. I'm really confident that this person went through their experiences and is, it grew from it or built extra skills in between and we think they're ready to go. That'll really help your slot as your, as the admissions committee is trying to decide where to rank you. Thank you, Dr. Safin. I just wanted to point out that Dr. Z has joined us from Albert Einstein. He's a PGY1. So if you have any questions specific to his program or um, just wanted to point out that he's joined us and so welcome Dr. Z. Okay. So the next question is, um, what is something that you know now that you wish you knew um, in your first year? So I guess this is um, for the residents or fellows and even Dr. Safin, I'm sure like you can pull stories from your residency days. Um, I probably would have wanted to know like you will survive intern year because I think intern year at times can feel very intolerable. Uh, so just remembering that it'll be over. Um, and psychiatry really is like nice. There's like that work-life balance. You can breathe um, during residency. And I say that NYU is pretty, or it was when I was there, like pretty call heavy. So even then like your worst psychiatry day is probably going to be like, better um, than your mediocre intern day. So just remembering like intern year will end um, and you'll be in psychiatry soon. Um, I'd probably just remind myself that a lot more. Very similarly, I was gonna say, you know, there are days during intern year when you're off service that are, they can be really tough and difficult and just remembering like, I'm on the road toward like doing what I want to do in the end. And, you know, it's just one single day um, is important to kind of remember. It was important for me. Um, yeah. And then you're on site full time and it's great. When I in my first year, through the second year, through the second year, so uh, not really by one, uh, expectations just look broader. Sorry, Dr. Koplova, I think I, I'm not sure if I'm alone here, but I think I might have missed some of what you said. Um, the connectivity might be a little erratic. So. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, the, I'm on the road. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, thank you for joining yeah. us, even though you're on the, I, I recall, yeah, you're traveling with your family. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Kovova. Thank you. So I was saying, uh, now that I'm second year, uh, sometimes I think if I looked uh, through the experience, uh, uh, through the eyes of the second year, um, kind of uh, see what their level of uh, um, responsibility, I think I would uh, uh even uh, don't think that gy1 is hard you know so it would help yeah i definitely hear you there um or i think i'll probably be able to commiserate more once i'm there but <laughs> thank you um so our next question is how competitive is psych becoming um and what are some ways to stand out if you are an average student Uh, competitive is the answer, unfortunately, uh, or wonderfully, if we all love the field, but it is definitely getting super competitive. And I don't quote me with the exact numbers because I haven't looked at the final thing, but I think this year there were something like 1,907 slots in the match. And I think 1,904 or 1,903 filled through the match. So, I mean, 
that's a huge shift from when you, if you go back 10 or 15 years where in the match cycle, there were only like a thousand, you know, excuse me, like 1200 slots in psychiatry and three or 400 of them didn't fill every match cycle. So you had a ton of people coming into psychiatry who really, it wasn't their passion. Um, that pendulum has swung drastically in this other direction. There's obviously such a huge need for mental health and it's wonderful, but it does make it more competitive for applicants um, and challenging for program directors. People are applying more broadly, trying to weed through all these different applications and get a sense of who might be willing to join you at your own program is is equally as confusing for program directors these days um but it is very competitive i think i think a lot of things of what some people have mentioned here around connectivity with patients you know it's still busy but it's not as short and quick as um um the exams and the time with patients isn't as short and quick as in some other fields. So I think a lot of those things are drawing people in as well as, you know, the flexibility within the field to kind of build um, your own work environment, your own space. There's a lot more space that you, different types of work that you can cobble together into one kind of job, either even at an academic institution or through different mixes of private practice and hospital work. And so I think a lot of that flexibility is very much of interest to a lot of medical students. So um, Yes, so competitiveness. There was a second part to the question, which I've now forgotten. I apologize. Yeah, the second part was um, ways to stand out. Um, what are some ways to stand out if you are an average student? Um, I think that things that help an average student stand out are um, if you're if you're defining average based on grades and or like board scores or number of uh, passage rate of different exams and stuff like that. If that's how we're defining average, I think it really is making sure that you have a, a, you know, reflect as much of what you've done outside in terms of extracurriculars, um, if you have done any research. And then, um, as you were mentioning before, when you're talking with your letter writers, if, if you are applying to psychiatry to really help them understand the arc of your story so that that can be reflected in your letters, that's something that really helps if you're an average student, if kind of the letters are reflective of your experience and the, the letters that your recommenders write um, kind of match up with the story that you put together through your ERAS, through how you've laid things out in there, or how you've told your personal statement stories. Um, I think that really can be a help because then it seems like a cohesive space that you have these people behind you that want to push you forward and propel you and that it feels connected. Um, so I, you know, even it, listen, we all don't know every letter writer. They're not our best friend. It's not, that's not, don't worry. That's not what we are looking for, but they're all willing to help you. If they're going to agree to write your letter, I think I would kind of have that conversation with them to make sure like, this is how I'm putting together my narrative. This is the story I'm trying to transmit to programs. And a lot of them will be willing to work with you on that. If they're not, or they give you some pushback, I might suggest that you try to find someone else because I, someone who's passionate about helping you move forward into that next step will take a little bit of time to do that. It doesn't take a, you know, take them long to make some small edits and stuff to your letter to really, really stand out. Thank you, Dr. Zappin. Did anybody else want to add to that question? Okay. Um, and another question was, um, how do you get interviews from places that aren't in your same region? I think um, for me, like I said, I was coming from a Midwest medical school and my family is in the Northeast. So it was important for me to try to come, come closer because my grandparents and all that. Um, for me, I tried to, if there was any regional anything um, that I could possibly put into the application, I put it. So like my permanent mailing address, I made my parents address instead of my um, school address. And I tried to um, put some activities if there was any geographic tie back to the Northeast, I put those. So I chose from college, like the couple of activities that had like, uh, you know, city names in the names, things like that. And then, like I said, I did email a couple of programs just to say, you know, I know I'm coming from the Midwest, but you know, my family's from the area and you know, I think our values align. I like um, just very brief email. Um, so that's kind of what I did to try to switch geographic regions. Um, but I do think, you know, I do think sometimes there is a preference for geography and I think it can help if you just try to highlight as much as you can um, if you're from a certain region or, or the reason why you want to go there. And, and just to add to that from the program director perspective, I would say 
It's a very mixed bag when I talk to program directors um, across the country. I think it depends on a couple of factors in terms of geography. I think the, all the reaching out and stuff that we've talked about is really helpful, particularly to target an area. Um, but I would say that I don't know that, um, I think it depends on the type of program and the size of a program and who their past matches have been that help influence where they are willing to take people or how much geography matters, right? Like I'm an East case. East Coast program based in Manhattan, like, but I still take, I interview people from across the country based on the fact that my residents within the pool of my 52 are from the East Coast, they're from Texas, they're from California, they're from Colorado, they're from Florida. So like, for me, that's not such a factor. Oftentimes when I talk to program directors who are at smaller programs where there may be four to six residents per class or sometimes smaller, um, sometimes they're a little bit more concerned if they're in a specific geographic region about interviewing too broadly because they don't have a ton of slots to give out. And so they really do want to know about your passion for their city, their area. And I think that's where that really plays in. I think larger programs and bigger programs, that's a little bit less of a factor just because people do tend to move around between these big cities and that's not uncommon in medicine. Um, but I think the smaller, more um, smaller size programs, it's a little more important, especially if it's in a unique uh, in a smaller geographic area. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I definitely agree, Dr. Seth and Dr. Rocas. Um, there, and I, I've noticed during this particular application cycle, there was a very large regional bias. Um, I'm not sure if that had to do with the limitation of a ways and um, just you having roots in a particular state might've helped your application a lot. So if you can make that really apparent, that is to your benefit. Um, the next question is for anyone who is deciding between applying for psychiatry and another specialty in third or fourth year, um, could they speak to what solidified their decision to pursue psychiatry? I think Dr. Rocca has touched on this earlier. Hey, if I could give my two cents. Um, Tarek, an intern from Einstein in Philadelphia. Um, I find that the patient population, especially in psychiatry, is one of the most unique that you'll find anywhere. Right now I'm on my internal medicine months, uh, on call, doing work, but at the same time, you come across those patients and you find that they're ignored because of the extra time you have to spend with those patients to make them and their families understand what they're going through. It is a challenge, don't get me wrong, but it's fulfilling when you have family members call you or reach out back to you. And when you reach out to patients, one of the things that I do is reach out to patients after they're out of my inpatient service to make sure that they're taking their medications. Um, it's one of the most fulfilling positions you could have. And you have to think from a, the patient side and their family side, a lot of the time they are ignored or they're, they, they're blown off by a lot of practitioners, unfortunately. I've witnessed it too many times, especially as a resident on this service. And people ignore the needs that they have because there's no lab value or CT scan that's attributed to it. So it's unique in the fact that you have the, that special skill set that you can actually improve someone's quality of life in completely by you. And you build on those skills, you build on your, uh, the people that you listen to, your mentors and what have you, that led you to build, have those skills to actually help that person and their family. Um, and that, that's what I would say, uh, honestly, it's very unique. To Dr. Deed, uh, Dr. Zeed, I think that's um, really insightful, and that's I think we've all kind of witnessed um, similar things on the wards. So, I mean, we're all here. We're all um, trying to get into psychiatry um, or have gotten into psychiatry. So, I think that's um, very insightful. I wanted to say I changed specialty from pediatrics in my country in Belarus. Uh, to psychiatry and what helped me is uh, professional experience that I was able to get as a nurse initially uh, in psychiatry. So just uh, exposure that you get if you try to decide between uh, specialties, uh, try to get deeper exposure and uh, it will um, 
just be an answer for you. Thank you, Dr. Kapova. Okay, so the next question is, what type of volunteer work stands out to program directors? Um, and I think the residents and um, fellows can also kind of add their two cents as some of them are involved in the uh, um, kind of admissions process. I'd say more than the type of work, what comes through is like your passion about the work. Um, so if you're just doing like work to have it on your CV and like we, like a lot of times I read the CV and if I'm more excited about the work than you, like that's a problem, right? So we wanna see that you're spending your time doing something you love, something that you enjoy. If it's connected to patients, great, or psychiatry, that's fine as well. Um, but a lot of it is just coming through and showing that you're passionate about something um, and that should really come across during the interview. So that's, I would say what I find most important. No, I, I would definitely agree with that. I, I was laughing when you were talking because I'm like, there is nothing worse than when I have read an application that I sit down with somebody virtually and I'm like, I'm so giddy about like this thing they've been doing. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh my, forget it. Then I'm like, if you're not excited about this. And like, so I think your example is so spot on. I feel like I've had that experience a few times each academic, uh, each interview season. Um, so, and, and I would say that in psychiatry, there's no experience that's not related, right? So that's the other thing too. I think people are so hyper-focused on, is it psychiatric adjacent or something? It, doesn't really matter. Psychiatry covers all the different aspects of medicine and we're looking at patients holistically in all these different ways. So whether you've worked, you know, I think you have different candidates from this year, like whether you've worked with a food bank or like any of that matters, right? It doesn't matter if you were seeing patients clinically or anything at this volunteer space. It really is about that passion. And I think the other thing that's helpful is if, and it's, you know, to highlight the things that you've done with more longevity. And that I'm not talking about necessarily years and years, but like if you've done everything for one week or two weeks or four weeks, like that kind of looks like you were bouncing around too much. And I might almost edit some of that out. Like, cause like, why did you only go there for two weeks? Did they tell you not to come back? Did they, did you not want to come back and you couldn't decide anything and we're doing like 22 week rotations? Like it's nice, but it's not so helpful. Cause I like to kind of see somebody who's made a commitment to something, whether that's six months, whether that's 10 months, like it's helped, even if you don't have to be the leader of it, but it, it kind of demonstrates as Dr. Martin was saying that passion or that interest in something and give, gives us an insight to part of your personality. Thank you, Dr. Safin um, and Dr. Martin. Um, the next question is, what are program directors looking for in a personal statement? I've asked myself this all every time I write a personal statement. Dr. Safin, I'm curious what, what your answer is. Um, the thing that we're looking for in a personal statement is I wanna be able, I mean, like I said, once I select, we interview 180 people each year. Like I wanna be able to remember you after I've read your thing. And so I, I have a team that reads and then I read each thing myself. It's a long, few weeks when I'm reading all these applications and my husband wants to know where the hell I went at the end of the four weeks, like I disappeared, but I pop my head up eventually. Um, but I, I want to remember you. And what that means is that um, you should be able to come off that page and it doesn't have to be miraculous. And I don't need, um, you know, I know there's, there's so many standard things that people try to follow and stuff like I want to put in a patient experience or it's got to be this kind of patient experience. Like, if you feel like you're putting something in there just to put it in there so you check a box, like that's gonna probably make for a weaker personal statement. If that patient experience that you wanna highlight or clinical engagement you wanna highlight really does kind of tend to talk about your arc um, and the story, like I, I, I'm very big on that. I think that, you know, when I talk to program directors, that's the thing that makes, I'm looking for 13 unique people each year and I wanna be excited to work with them over the coming three or four years, depending whether they fast track. And so you're all strong candidates. Everyone's worked so hard, everyone's very bright. So it's like, I'm not, some of that stuff, I'm like parsing hairs, but when I see this story, if I can get the arc, I know it's hard to do in one page, but if that kind of captures where your interest came, um, 
I think Dr. Rockus was saying how like she did anthropology in the beginning and that was where the space was around like she liked stories and that kind of caught her and maybe she wasn't sure but then all of a sudden she realized she wanted more time to explore that passion so that may be her story uh, excuse me for guessing but like that may be some of your story arc about why psychiatry really drew you in and if that's kind of the story she tells across her personal statement then I walk away being like wow that's really interesting I love that that's how she came to it from her perspective and then maybe there was a volunteer experience that helped add to that or maybe there was a patient she had that really solidified that for her but I walk away with saying like here we go versus like she had an experience with a psychotic patient she had an experience with uh, someone with depression or like great, wonderful, but hopefully we all have through med school so we can get some learning, but I want to know why, why this fit for her in that space. And we do read them. It's one of the, I think, one of the really important things. I know people wonder if we read them, we read them. And that's like, because it really is where it ties it all together. Thank you, Dr. Safin. I think that's been a burning question in all our hearts ever since applying. <laughs> Um, this is a question that's come up multiple times um, in the registration as well as in the chat just now. Um, what are some important ways that I can boost my application and stand out amongst my peers? So something I did um, was I joined up with uh, some residents in psychiatry that gave me some, I'm sorry, Gerald, I'm, um, joined up in psychiatry in with some psychiatric residents that had some very interesting cases and we did basically um uh, literature review one of them was a case report and we presented at the apa and there was a great way to meet people and uh, network basically just to get your name out there um and I've met some amazing people, uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, you, it's not in person anymore. Uh, but definitely try to find something that you're interested in and try to find another resident that's interested in working in that certain subject and do, do some research. Even if it's a poster, I found just presenting a poster, I was able to network a lot better with it. I, I think I got at least two or three interviews from my posters, hands down. Uh, and a an, uh, really interesting rotation I was able to get because I presented at the APA. Unfortunately, I do not believe that the APA will be presenting for a while <laughs> in person. But even if it's virtual, again, if you know the subject that you're presenting and you can actually show your skills the way you um, are able to approach a certain case, I think you can show your skills off by presenting it in an appropriate way. Um, that would be my suggestion. Just find something you like, research it. I think that's great advice, Dr. Z. Um, so uh, we've reached 520. We were supposed to end um, now, but we did start the Q&A um, slightly late. Um, I don't wanna pressure the panelists into staying on a few minutes later if you can't. Uh, but if you need to leave, um, that's definitely okay. Okay, so I'm going to uh, push forward then with a couple more questions, uh, perhaps for another 10 minutes, if that's all right. Okay, um, so uh, one question is, uh, with step one being pass-fail, this is somewhat related to the previous question, slightly more nuanced, with step one being pass-fail in future match cycles, um, does an applicant with a low step one second attempt, but a high score on step two CK, look better than they would have in previous match cycles? And if not, what could be done to strengthen that application? So just so I'm clear in understanding the question from the difference from the one before. So they're saying now that the new scores will be pass fail, somebody who already has a numbered score that's lower in their step one and then a good step two, how does how do they make themselves stand out? Um again, I, the best answer to that, like I outside of scores that are like uh trying to think. So when, I know everyone's always so hyper-focused on the scores. So like the scores, 
count and don't count? Like I would say like, if you have, let's say you failed, like let's say with this low step one score, like let's say you failed five times the first go round until you passed with like the fifth attempt, like that's challenging, right? And you've really got to speak to that and explain that somewhere in this application process. And, you know, if your step, step two is high, if you're higher in terms of the number, if you're step one scores low and then your step two scores higher, great as well. Like, you know, that'll show trajectory and learning, but also then we want to see how you performed in your um, clinical rotations and, you know, not just psychiatry, but across the board, like what's the theme here of how your performance is. Um, and so I think, it, it, you know, if you've failed multiple times on each thing, then you do have to explain that. People are gonna to wanna to know why, how, what, like, and what, you know, how they can trust that you've started to work on remedying some of those challenges along the way. Um, and that's gonna be the case, whether even now that it's past fail, there'll be people who will wind up in that fail space and will have to um, have that same journey. But outside of that, like, it really is about making sure that you can build a strong narrative, right? Program directors kind of know, um, uh, they kind of know the area with like within all this stuff that they kind of pull from in terms of who, what's the type of person that comes to their program in terms of all different things, skills, interests, scores, things like that. So people will be looking at each kind of candidate in that space a little bit above and a little bit below. So everyone's viable in certain places. And so I, I would make sure if those things are there that you're still, again, making sure you have a strong overall arc and you're, you have a good way to pitch your story to a team so that you can kind of um, show your interest. You don't have to be, you have to find something magical because we all have love of psychiatry. So it's not about just you, but just making sure that your story feels cohesive and that some of these challenges that you may have encountered are explained. I can speak a little bit to the cohesion as well. Um, it's interesting because the program director at the medical school I went to was telling me, go through and delete half of your activities. We know you like a lot of things. And he was like, but who are you? I look at this and I have no idea who you are. So it's interesting you keep mentioning this, but I, for me personally, I, I was successful in just deleting some of the activities that I had done for like a shorter period or I wasn't as passionate about so that during the interview, when someone asked me, like, what did you do here? I was like, super excited about it. I was like, oh, I did that for like a year. It was great. This is what we did. This is why I'm passionate about it, you know? And it was, it made it, I think, easier for me in the interview and easier for other people when they were reading the application. All right, thank you. The next question is, um, somebody wants to ask how a CS exam attempt, attempt is being measured. Um, with residency programs now that it is um, discontinued with no chance for remediation. So I think um, this particular individual might ha have had an unsuccessful attempt. So um, yeah, how can that, um, how would that be measured? Um, so I, again, I think at this point, we, you, like you said, that you can't reattempt. It's, we understand and we know where that's at. And so again, we're going to then um, need to look through the rest of the application and see how that ties in with things, right? Like not everybody has a great day that day. It is, you know, we are well aware that this is this kind of one moment in time and that none of us are defined by that space. And so I, you know, I think being able to kind of speak to that, what you think might have gone wrong in those spaces, like maybe not necessarily in that depth on the application on the ERAS space, but um, if and when you're in person, I think if that's something that you can kind of bring up, like I know this, this was a challenging area. This is what I've worked on since then. I think there's ways to kind of weave that in at interviews and stuff in small ways. I wouldn't take up most of your interview time with that, but it is something you might want to weave in at that space. Thank you. The next question is, do spots sometimes open up post soap for uh, the same year's match? Um, they do. Um, people, just like any other field, any other profession, people move around, people change their mind, people have life circumstances changing. Um, so I, I don't know that I would say it's, um, you know, a ton of spaces, but there are every year a bunch of slots that open up throughout the year, right? Like, um, even in my own program, I had somebody two cycle, two or three cycles ago, gosh, I should remember, but um, like who decided 
in October after just matching in PGY1 that they were going to go back to do some work in a startup for business and decided to step out of residency. And so we took somebody off cycle who didn't match, you know, in that space. And so a lot of times the thing to do is if you to keep make sure you keep in touch with your medical schools, because oftentimes when program directors have slots like in that off cycle space, we don't have a formal way to um, reach out to people in terms of like who's available, who might be interested. So we have to kind of tap our networks. And so oftentimes um, we will reach out to different medical schools where we know we've had successful matches from before um, and reach out and say, hey, we have a slot. A lot of times that information gets sent out amongst different program directors who then share that with their, you know, amongst the psychiatric program directors nationally to then tell them to share it with their with their medical schools in case someone is looking for a slot or does have spaces. Um, if there are programs that you were interested in or had a good connection with, it doesn't hurt. I mean, I wouldn't do it uh, 50 times, but like once, you know, if you want to send an email, like, you know, if you didn't match and you're like, listen, in case something comes up, please keep me in mind. I might be interested in joining. It's, that doesn't hurt, right? Again, not five paragraphs, but like a sentence or two, you know, not a sentence or two, like maybe three or four, but something like that, that puts you on the radar of things, but definitely through your medical school, um, keeping in touch in those spaces, or if you've built any relationships with any different program directors or researchers, just to keep your ear to the ground. Yeah, I think one of my friends didn't match in a different specialty. And I think for her, she ended up finding a position um, because she was you know, it, it doesn't feel good, but she was very vocal with her mentors and with people she'd done research with and different groups she'd been a part of just saying, hey, I'm just reaching out because, you know, I unfortunately didn't match. If you hear anything, you know, I really enjoyed working with you and I think you probably know some good people. So, you know, just keep an eye out and I'm here. And it ended up working out for her. I know it's like, it's a hard thing to do, um, but it ended up um, kind of working just with people that she knew, not like random people, but just just uh, her her own network. Thank you, Dr. Seth and Dr. Rakos. I think we have time for one final question. Um, the last question is, what is expected of a fourth year student interested in doing an audition rotation in psychiatry um, to show or be able to show during said fourth year rotation in order to impress the program they are auditioning for? Um, so I, from, I will say that really it's a bunch of different things and it's not things that are so you know, so first of all, you have to do good on the rotation, right? Like whatever the rotation is in terms of like, you carry one patient, you carry four patients, like they want to see that you're kind of on top of things. It doesn't Now that doesn't mean you have to be the expert. No one's expecting you to be the attending, anything like that, but they want to see that you're engaged, that you're kind of organized, that you can um, ask questions when you need help and reach out and kind of get yourself oriented. They know it's a short run, um, but, you know, actually performing well is helpful while you're there. Um, I think that if you're interested, if you're doing a psychiatry rotation at a, at a, pro, at a residency program, um, it's always helpful to make sure you, you know, build a connection with the attending you're working with so that they can kind of talk you up to the program director. And then also I would say as a program director myself, when people like this past year, my system has not allowed rotators because of COVID. Um, but in the past, when someone is rotating, make sure if the program director doesn't reach out to you that you reach out to the program director um, early on and you're like, let's say it's four weeks as an example, like reach out to them in week one and say, listen, I'm here for these next three and a half weeks. I'd really love to stop by and see you and tell you about my interest in the field um, and get some time on the table. Because if you get in there and you talk to that program director and they um, find your story interesting and compelling. And then, you know, they're going to check in with their attending and their residents thereafter to be like, how did you like how Dan did on that rotation? Did he do a good job? Did he not do a good job? Do you think he'd fit in? Like they're going to ask, and then they're going to remember that going into the interview season. So, but you do want to get in front of them because if you just do good in the space and kind of stay siloed away, I, I can't say every program director is going to take the time to meet with you. I know a lot of the people, program directors in my health system, we have just three different uh, psychiatry residencies in New York City. And so I know we all do, but and I think a lot of program directors do because it's a great way for us to get to know you. Obviously, you came to do something. Um, and so that does mean you have some interest and, you know, it helps me have some perspective. But wherever you go to do that, I think that's a big helpful thing you can do. Yeah. And something just to keep in mind is like, it's, it's awesome to get along with everyone and, and like, 
josh around and kid but just remember like don't go out with like the residents and like get totally trashed like the audition is kind of like an extension of the interview so just remember that like if something goes awry and like there's a red flag just be careful um you know, and and how you're presenting yourself. Um, Like it's, you should definitely have fun, but just, uh, just be aware that every, you know, anyone could be asked like, Hey, did Susie do okay? And like, if Susie did something really inappropriate, then that would be brought up. Um, Yeah. I think you make a really excellent point. And if, if you have a second, I'll just, the one thing that that makes me think of a little bit aside from this, but it's so important like to kind of think about all your interactions as you're down this trail as that professional space. And the one thing that I think some people don't seem to get still in this day and age, and I, I'm obviously way older than you all, so I have a different perspective, but the whole social media thing, you've got to be careful of what you put on social media. I personally, as the program director, I am not looking this stuff up. My residents are looking this stuff up because they're going to be working with you for four or five years. And so like, I don't, like, it's not part of my factor, but everyone's like, am I going to want to sit in the room with this person for eight hours a day for the next, you know, three years? And so they're like, oh my gosh, I looked on and you should see what, and I'm like, I don't want to see it. Don't tell me, but like, make sure your personal, your social media stuff, the stuff that's publicly accessible looks professional. I'm not saying it has to be doctorish, but like, you know, occasionally you see something, some residents come in and be like, this person rotated with us and look what's here. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'm like, I don't want to see, like, I don't want to know, but that's, that's that extension of what Mary's Dr. Rockus is talking about. Yeah. Direct advice. Just put everything on private as your profile picture. If it's your name and you don't want to lose the account, put like you in front of a cute building or something or a flower tree and just leave it at that. Yeah. Just something like benign and nothing like a nothing thing people look and they're like oh she's in front of a bush it's fine because you don't want that to be the thing that prevents you from matching to the place that you really wanted in case they come across it i I think that's so important and thank you for addressing that (laughs) Um, I just want to touch base with um, Damien Pizarro and Trey Abassine. They've been helping in the background today. They've been a really big help. They're local psych sig leaders in New York. Um, guys, have uh, was there anything else that we needed to address during the Q&A? Feel free to unmute yourself. No, Tammy, I think you got all the questions that I was keeping an eye out for. So thank you once again to all the panelists. Um, it's been really great to hear and to meet with other students all day as well. It's great to meet you all. Great. Damien, anything? Uh, no, I agree. I think that's it. Thank you again to everyone for taking the time to speak to us. I really appreciate it to myself as a first year learning. This was like my first real experience uh, hearing these, these type of things. So I'm very grateful for this uh, um, opportunity. All right, great. Thank you, guys. So I just wanted to thank everyone. Thank all our panelists, Dr. Staffan, Dr. Rakas, Dr. Koplova, Dr. Z. Thank you so much uh, for spending a big chunk of your Saturday with us. I know the weather's great outside and you chose to spend that time with us. Although Dr. Z doesn't have a choice. You're, you know, you're trapped as it is. But thank you for your service and thank you for your help to us all. Um, so the time is now 5.35 um, EST, so we're all, all out of time for the questions, um, but um, I'll try to get those answers out to you in an email, um, if that's possible, if I can touch base with the panelists at a later time. Um, so this marks the conclusion of our uh, 2021 um, conference. Again, thank you so much to the panelists. Um, I just want to take a quick moment to share my screen. Um, Okay, so those are itinerary for today. Okay, all right, so I just wanted to make some um, short acknowledgements. Um, thank you again to all our panelists. Um, we thank you for dedicating your time to helping our future psychiatrists um, on their career path. And many thanks to our speakers, uh, Dr. Verani, Dr. Avery, and Dr. Pender, um, as well as Clara Kelly, uh, Zach Sandler, Marla Schultz at NAMI NYC. Um, special thanks to Donna Gaida at NISPA, that's the New York State Psychiatric Association, and Megan O'Toole at uh, the New York City Psychiatric Association for helping us to connect us with our speakers and panelists. Um, you were both um, an amazing source of guidance and help. A big hand to Shreya Vassine and Damien Pizarro for helping to monitor today's events. Um, and you we're all indispensable to this conference's success. We appreciate you all and your efforts to continue educating and inspiring the next generation of psychiatrists. 
Um, I also want to thank everyone in attendance. Um, thank you for dedicating your entire Saturday to joining us and learning more about psychiatry and increasing your knowledge base. All the recordings will be made available on Psych Science Region 2 YouTube channel. Uh, the residency application overview presentation will be shared via email. And if you have any additional questions, please reach out to me at psychsignr2 at gmail.com. And we hope you found the day informative and helpful. Thank you all. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.